Have you ever wondered if your company is maximizing the return of your data investment? Are you collecting the right data required to make informed decisions? Is there more that can be learned from our data? Koyas Institute can answer these questions and help you discover the hidden value within your data sets by utilizing a well-rounded approach to data analysis. Stop leaving value behind and start increasing the return on your data investment. The next generation of data analysis has begun. We are pioneers in pattern discovery. We are Koyas Institute. What's your poison? What are you sipping on right there? A wild yak Pacific ale. It's quite nice. Come nice. ale. It's lovely. Sounds positively delightful, Ross. I've earned it after my day in the garden. Oh yeah, it's been a been a gardening day for you. I'm meant to be um, finishing my book, and my publisher is cracking the whip on me, saying they want it by the end of next week. And, and instead, uh, you're poking around the shrubbery. I just felt like I needed some bonding with nature, to be perfectly honest. My daughter's very into it. She takes her shoes off and goes around walking in bare feet, wilding, mm. connecting with the earth. She swears blue and blind. It's absolutely essential for all us humans. Well, you know, it's funny It's funny you mention that because as, as I was lying there at 4 a.m. questioning <laughs> why my brain is racing with ideas and thoughts about what we're going to talk about, I had the exact same feeling of you know what, I think I need a little bit of a, you know, just a, a three-day retreat or something like that. And funnily enough, a couple of days ago, I was having a really lovely talk with a subscriber to the channel who's a Buddhist monk. And what's interesting about this guy is that he emailed me a while back and introduced himself and said he was interested in the subject and that he liked my channel. And he, he mentioned where he was, and he's based in a monastery in an area of England called Hertfordshire, which I actually used to live in. I know Hertfordshire. <laughs> yeah, and I've been past that monastery before, long before I was involved in this subject. And then here's a, here's a guy from the uh, monastery reaching out, saying that he you know enjoys my channel. And he did invite me over there and said, hey, if you ever need to unplug, then you could come here and spend a few days at the monastery. Oh, so that's lovely of it. Maybe I'll uh, get you know, far nicer. You, you have far nicer guests, uh, viewers than I do. Nobody uh, 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 yeah, uh, yeah, Give me uh, five seconds. I'm just going to no put problem. my, I'm going to hide my mic and elevate my laptop slightly. No problem. Should we crack on, old boy? Sure. Give it a go. One of the things I'd love to start off with, just, uh, because I've I've known you, I've been fortunate enough to to know you since you've been dipping your toes into the subject publicly, and uh, it's been a few years now. So, I mean, how are you feeling with the whole thing, the whole subject? It's it's such a mind fuck to try and traverse all of this stuff. And so, I guess right now, what's the uh, what's the status on Ross and the UFO subject, and how do you feel about the whole thing? You know, it's weird. I was only about three hours ago on a lawnmower mowing up and down, which is where I do my best thinking. And I was thinking to myself, why am I the only person in the world who wants to know urgently what Professor Gary Nolan's referring to when he talks about a shadow biome? Mm. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing about this subject matter is it is so compelling. And I, I get despondent, Jay. I do. I mean, like everybody, you sort of get, have your ups and downs. And um, I'm a naturally optimistic person. But... Um, uh, I do get despondent about this subject matter, and I've been despondent more than at any stage, and still am, uh, since about late last year, uh, because the messages I'm getting about what's going on behind the scenes um, aren't positive for what I think we're all hoping might come out of all of this. Well, let's let's expand on that a little, if you can. In what way do you feel that's the message? Um, I, I, I do think that there is a really big push uh, in the Congress at the, uh, the key oversight committees, the Armed Services Committee and the um, Senate Intelligence Committee. They're doing some fantastic work behind the scenes to get people to come and give evidence. And um, I think um, that's happening. 
you know, and I'm aware of people, I won't call them whistleblowers, I'm aware of witnesses who are coming forward, who purport to have knowledge of very extraordinary things who are coming forward and um, they are being talked to and they're being given the assurances and protections that they should properly be being given under the legislation. So that side of things is looking good. So what am I despondent about? Well, I guess I'm despondent about the fact that what I'm hearing is, yes, whatever this is, will probably be brought to the knowledge and attention of key members of Congress. I mean, it hasn't been, what we're talking about is the allegation that there's a legacy UAP program, that essentially since World War II, there's been a a, a program which has secretly attempted to retrieve and back-engineer non-human technology. You can hardly believe I say that, by the way. It's just extraordinary. I've come a long way in the few years that I've known you because I didn't, didn't used to believe that. But I do know. I do think the evidence is compelling that, um, that somewhere in the United States there is retrieved non-human technology and that people are endeavoring, endeavoring to back-engineer it. I wouldn't say I'm 100% on it, but I'm pretty convinced. But what I do have a concern about is obviously what these technologies represent is mind-blowing, if true. You know, if they really are attempting to back-engineer craft that are capable of the five observables, incredible manoeuvres, you know, right-hand turns without changing speed at thousands of kilometres an hour, it, it suggests they have propulsion systems and energy systems that are way beyond what we're capable of. But are we going to be told about it? And I guess as a journalist, what I'm quite shocked by is how the incident of the Chinese balloon shoot down brought to light just how easily manipulable the media and the public are on this issue. And uh, what I've been hearing for a while in uh, Washington and from different sources is that there's basically a bit of a pushback that's been happening, mainly from the Air Force, but also from sections of the CIA. And the argument that's being used is that um, now is not the time, that the world is an incredibly precarious state. You know, we're teetering on the edge of World War Three, and we quite literally are. Uh, it's a very dangerous time not just in the Ukraine, but also in the Taiwan Strait. And um, I think the argument is resonating that, you know, basically this should be quietly shut down. Now, um, why are the Chinese balloons relevant? I don't think the three objects that were allegedly shot down, uh, but not retrieved, are necessarily anomalous. What concerns me is we just don't bloody know. And the incredible thing is how glibly, meekly, acquiescently the media just stopped asking questions. I mean, it's quite breathtaking when you think about it. And to me, it underlines a fundamental problem with this subject matter that there's such a high degree of stigma attached to the issue of UAPs that um, when for the first time the subject matter of unidentified objects in American airspace became a national and international issue, all because the Biden administration almost certainly overreacted to a stray Chinese spy balloon. They turned up the sensors and they noticed something there that had probably been there all along. And they ordered it to be shot down incredibly yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing, mate, when you think about it. That well, it's in the, the first, entire first dis- time in history, right? first time. It's, it's the first time in history, the first time in the history of NORAD that weapons were used to bring down an unidentified object over American airspace. Mm. And, they, uh, and they did it over a twelve-dollar hobby balloon. Well, that's what they've led you to believe. But let's just stop for a moment there. Why do we say it's a twelve-dollar ho- ho- hobby balloon? We say that because that's the line that's being pushed from the Pentagon. This is very, very reminiscent of Roswell. 
just this weird it's even if amazing. it's even if it's not got anything to do with ufos just the fact that ufos are in the conversation and then you have like a shoot down and oh it was cylindrical and loitering no it was a weather balloon it's just like whoa hang on a second this feels like history repeating yeah. itself. I, mean, uh, I i i what what i'm getting to here is i think we're going to be shut down on learning anything about what the congress is now being told in right. private skiffs I, I think there's a push on, a really strong push on from the Air Force to make sure the public does not know what it has done, almost certainly illegally, for quite a number of years. And the best way to to look at that is through the lens of how the public was shut down, basically to avoid embarrassment. I mean, let's say it was a $10 hobby balloon. Let's say it was. Are you seriously suggesting to me that the resources of the United States, NRO, Geospatial, um, the, the entire US Air Force, military personnel could not find any one of the three objects that were brought down? I refuse to call them balloons. Mm -hmm. Why are they not releasing the videos? Yeah. I mean, exactly. why, why, why don't we just roll over supine? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not an American taxpayer, and God forbid, but... Um, why do American taxpayers just meekly accept this stuff? I, I think that there's a lot of unanswered questions from that incident. And if you just treat it as an exercise in analysis of how easily manipulated the media and the public are, what that Chinese balloon incident shows me is there's no hope, really. I mean, I, I just think that the, the fact that they neatly started sowing ideas. Initially, you had a NORAD um, uh, colonel, a major, a major, uh, asserting, we know what these objects are. And so nobody at the White House press conference asked, why do you know what these objects are? I mean, this is the thing that just I do not understand is basic journalism is abandoned when it comes to the subject of UAP. Now, UAP is a term to describe unidentified anomalous phenomena, but they used the words unidentified objects over the United States. You had the President of the United States, the White House National Security Advisor, making an announcement that there were unidentified objects over US airspace. And this is the first time ever that this subject matter has come to the forefront of the news bulletins and the way it did. But you think about it, look how it's just dropped off the news cycle. And what do we know now? about these incidents, these three shoot downs. Silch. Nothing. Now, don't you think if these things were innocuous objects, easily described as innocuous objects, don't you think they'd want to be seen, to be explaining that? Are we meant to assume that because it was a $13 hobby balloon, as they claim, that they're just embarrassed that they spent $400,000 on an Abeside Winder missile to bring down this balloon? I just worry a little bit that we just don't ask enough questions. I've got a bloke who's been contacting me from Alaska who tells me he saw no evidence of a search. None. He saw no aerial activity, no road activity, no trucks in or out, no soldiers, no air crew, no hotels booked for search parties. If there was a search, this bloke's in the exact area where it happened, nothing. Um, uh, uh, are we to assume, for example, that at the point when they fired a signed wind of missile, they didn't have satellite systems monitoring what was brought down? Are we to assume that somehow the video that was shot from the F-16s that engaged, I think, at least one of these objects, um, which definitely had gun cameras, well, why can't we see the videos? Yeah, I mean, the thing is... Um, the problem is the contrast between the Chinese balloon and the coverage, because like you said, I mean, we had so many uh, photos and, and videos highlighting that it was the balloon, that you could tell it was a balloon. And this is a completely different set of of, uh, of stories here with a with a obfuscation level that's much higher. And we have no we have no information, essentially no information. And there has been classified briefings. I mean, I saw a video of Marco Rubio talking on camera um, before he was going into a briefing saying that, you know, and yet, and yet what Marco said, what Marco said was, frankly, they don't have any idea what these objects are. Yeah, it, it, well, exactly. And, and again, it, 
talking about these conflicting reports now i'm i'm gonna have to try and track down the staffer who said this because i saw it was on a news report it was on a a comment from uh, from a politician but i i can't remember who it was and this was early on and he said that there had been a significant amount of debris retrieved and it was already on its way to labs to be studied. And I remember hearing that. I have to try and dig it up because now they're saying no debris has been retrieved. So there's all of these contradictions in, in the story. And so, I, yeah, I mean, this I don't know if it's, like you said, specifically UFO related in that regard, but there's certainly something very suspicious about the way in which they're treating this. And uh, you can contrast it with the coverage of the Chinese balloon to kind of get an idea for why it's being treated a different way. It must be a different type of platform. It must be something they do not want people to know about. And when General Glenn Van Herc, the U.S. military commander for North America on Sunday, the 12th of February, said, I haven't ruled out anything at this point when he was asked if the UFOs were being right. operated by right. extraterrestrials. Why didn't somebody follow up with them afterwards and basically say, General, why did you why did you pour that fuel? Why did you pour that incendiary idea on the national media that he can't rule out the possibility that this is extraterrestrials? Was he just being extraordinarily candid? Or, or was there, are we entitled to have some kind of a suspicion that there's something more to this incident than we're being told? I, I just worry that, that we've got to a stage now where the national security press, the defense media, the White House press corps, they're like tame little puppies. Yeah, yeah. They come, they come in and they just don't ask the basic questions. And I, I, I really, I mean, I'm not suggesting that these objects were necessarily anomalous, but is it possible, for example, that when they, they launched their aimed Sidewinder missile, and by the way, one of them missed, it, they admit that one of them missed, they fired two. Is it possible they missed the objects completely? And that whatever these objects were, scarpered. And is that why they've got nothing to retrieve? Why is it that one of the people who was interviewed said that when one of these objects was hit, um, it broke apart as if it was splintering like a, a metal object? Right, right. And also that there was dis uh, disruption to the sensor systems of one of the yeah. uh, of one of the jets. Yeah, I know. And, and I mean, I noticed Chris Mellon picked up on that. You know, he yeah. was very concerned yeah. in the statement that he gave that whatever these objects were, they they appeared, or reportedly, meddled with the sensor systems of the aircraft. Now, maybe it's just that the objects were balloons and that the type of sensor system that they have, which probably should remain confidential, can't hold a fix very well on a balloon. Maybe that's the explanation. But Jay, if it was a bloody balloon, why the hell can't we see the pictures? I mean, if they've got nothing to hide, why not reveal it? And and this is, this is the issue, and this is what happens time and time again in this issue. I mean, I've I just noticed today our friend John Greenwald at the Black Vault published a really interesting story about a tic-tac-shaped object, quite a large one, that was detected by a system called Sentinel in orbit. Mm -hmm. Did you no, see any nothing, national media nothing. about that today? No, no, no. I mean, I, I, but, I mean I've, I mean, I've become accustomed to that at this point. It's just... Uh... Well, what is going on? I mean, I, 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 I just think... I mean, I've... I've covered national security defense as a brief. You know, you don't let politicians off the way you let Joe Biden off on this issue. OK, let's assume for a moment that this was just a big embarrassment because they they overreacted to a Chinese balloon that probably the Chinese never intended to stray across the continental United States, as evidence now suggests. And they brought it down and there was such a media furor even though these incidents happen all the time, there was such a media furor that uh, it, at the political level in the White House, um, Jake Kirby basically uh, was forced to, you know, make statements about, you know, what what what's been instructed, and you know, he as a result of that shoot down and of these other incidents, the president instructed the intelligence community to take a broad look at the phenomenon of unidentified aerial objects, and. It came out that Joe Biden had conducted the first ever daily intelligent briefing session devoted to this phenomenon back in June 2021. He was briefed that this is not just an issue for the US, but one for the rest of the world. I mean, when Jake Kirby started making statements like that, he, he wasn't talking about Chinese balloons or hobby, hobby balloons. 
There was a moment when the White House was seriously engaging with this issue because they were genuinely of the impression that these objects were something else. And this is what worries me, is that have we let the politicians off the hook? What happened in those briefings? Because I know uh, Marco Rubio came out and he wasn't very impressed with what he'd been told. They weren't really told very much more than what was already in the public arena. Oh, I don't, I sure. don't think that they would have been shown much. Yeah. I don't and know. they weren't shown videos. And this is my... Uh, the, 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 the people like John Kennedy, Senator John Kennedy, who came out of the um, Senate briefing on Tuesday the 14th of February, and he just, he wasn't talking about Chinese balloons when he said, I'll try and do his accent. These objects have been, I won't do it, have been flying over us for years, many years. We've known about those objects for many years. We're not sure that we've known about all of them. Except for the Chinese spy balloon, we don't know what they are. What's different about the last two weeks is that we've started shooting them down, but we can't find the remnants except for the spy balloon, and that's what I took away from the hearing today. Then he said, this has been going on for a long time, and we don't know what most of them are. The President and the DNI need to explain what these things are. Who put them up there, and do they pose a threat? Now, I'm sorry, I, I know John Kennedy's not a very senior member of the Congress or the Senate, but he's a person who's been given a private briefing. He, he knows things. What was he told that made him think clearly that this was just more than a... I mean, he was not talking there about the possibility that this could be some hobby balloon. And also, everybody I talk to says it's not possible for a hobby balloon to get up to that level of 40, 50,000 feet. I think one of these objects was at 60,000 feet. You know, what are these questions not being asked? Well, I mean, it feels, it, to be honest, not even just in the UFO subject, but political coverage in general, um, national security, journalism really isn't what it used to be, eh? I mean, it really does feel like there's a real hesitancy to do anything other than toe the line of the establishment narrative on whatever is being put out by the government as the uh, the narrative to be understood and so they report on it through that kind of channel and I don't really feel like I've seen over the last handful of years a whole lot of direct questioning from journalists in the newsroom and in the uh, in the White House when they're speaking with these people so I, I don't know man uh, we need we need stronger willed journalists in front of these politicians and, and in front of uh, you know the the congressmen and the senators asking tough questions but I, I don't see it coming. Do you really think that the momentum is completely lost or do you feel like there is still a chance that we could still get some level of discourse flowing over the years? I mean, we, we also have to take into account that the scientific community is becoming a little bit more engaged in this. It is not just a governmental issue and it won't always be just a governmental issue. Um, there's also obviously the potential for the phenomenon itself to just simply decide, you know what, maybe it's time humanity starts to wake up a little bit and maybe they'll begin lifting the veil. I mean. I would say ultimately the phenomenon holds all the cards when it comes to uh, truly, uh, you know, revealing its presence. But in terms of government discussion, government disclosure, are we at a dead end? Is that how you feel? Um, I I'm worried. I I'm worried that if it's that easy to snow the media on something as embarrassing as a bunch of balloons being shot down, if that's truly what they were, I I wor I'm worried that Frankly, there is a massive pushback, and I've, numerous sources have told me there is a massive pushback from different sections of the military and the intelligence community at the moment trying to shut this down. And um, the one positive, the one positive is that we have a bipartisan push on the Hill. You know, both sides of politics have pushed for the ARO, the, the um, mm. Yeah. All domain anomaly resolution office. I got it right for the first time. Well done. Um, uh, to be um, uh, to be given more resources, and it just outrageous that this body, which is investigating such an important issue, was only given three staff. Three staff. In the last three staff. few days. Yeah, I, I, I was going to bring that up. And Marco Rubio, basically, in his doorstop, also on the fourteenth of February. I mean, he basically said ninety-five percent of the information that he'd received in the private hearing 
could be made public without compromising the security of the country. Um, uh, so why is it not out? Basically, right? why is it not out? Yeah, I mean, and, and if that's true, release the video. Release the video. Yeah. Release yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, I, and and the thing that worries me is the media are so worried about their reputations, and they're so worried about the potential for losing the drip. You know, this is. The, the background story to all of this, Jay, is that what happens in journalism is if you're a journo that rocks the boat on, say, a national security story, you don't get invited to the cosy little briefings in the Pentagon. You don't you don't get the trip out to the aircraft carrier in the Coral Sea. You know, you, you, you have to be fairly compliant to be on the invite list. And so to be a member of the White House Press Corps, you know, you're part of a clear... Yeah, you have, to be a, you have to be a sellout. You have to be a sellout, basically. In terms well, of, you know, I actually, in there's, terms some, of your there's, there's some journos in the White House Press Corps who I actually really admire. But what worried me is there's such a traditional stigma and taboo associated with the subject of unidentified objects in the sky that I reckon the media just worried if I start asking questions about this, people might laugh at me. Oh my God! You know, really, I, I really think it's as puerile as that. That that the 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 questions weren't asked. I I actually think if people had really pushed Biden on the fact that politicians were coming out of private briefings saying, as Marco Rubio did, you know, um, there there have been hundreds of these incidents in the past. My concern is the DoD is not sharing that information with scientists on the interagency group. So you can't compare the data we have on these incidents from the ones we have retrospectively in the past. And he said, this is about whether an adversary has developed a capability that they know we're not looking for because our systems are set up to see missiles and airplanes. They're not set up to see smaller objects at lower altitudes. Um, so Marco Rubio's onto this and I'm heartened because He's on obviously the Republican side of politics, and there are people like Senator uh, Kirsten Gillibrand on the Democrat side, and they they're both in a bipartisan way calling for resources. The big question in my mind, though, is will it ever leak? Because a lot of people say everything leaks, but would something as momentous, for example, let's hypothetically assume that it is true that witnesses are now coming forward giving evidence of legacy craft retrieval programs where the programs are now attempting to back engineer technology. I can understand that the members of congressional committees might be very susceptible to an argument being made by senior members of the military and the intelligence services hypothetically that yeah okay we did keep this out of the purview of the oversight committees for many years and that was wrong. Maybe it was authorised by a presidential order by some previous president. We just don't know. But maybe they thought they were doing the right thing and just maybe there's a risk that the committees might buy into that and accept that that's a plausible argument. I mean, maybe for the US, the development of the technologies behind what we're talking about here, propulsion systems, energy systems, represent such a strategic advantage that the last thing they want to do is be forced, even by their Congress, into an admission that such a program exists. And so I, I'm just a little bit nervous that, um, you know, we might see a shutdown. And uh, it's why it's so important for people to keep the pressure up. And it's why it's so important that the media keep the pressure up as well. And that that's my worry is that... Um, the lesson, if there was one lesson that came out of Balloon Gate, uh, it was the um, supine acquiescence of the mainstream media that chased the issue for a while. But the moment they were told, oh, these might have been a hobby balloon, did you notice how that just so quickly killed the debate? Oh, completely, completely. Don't you think if they did have vision of a hobby balloon, show it to us? This is the thing I don't understand. I mean, and are we really meant to believe that the deployed resources, millions of dollars that were spent allegedly on searching for these objects? I mean, there was a bloke in, in Alaska posting images of a beautiful clear sky day with a clear white expanse landscape sprayed out in front of him. 
do you seriously mean to say that a helicopter in an area of, say, 20 square miles couldn't find anything from a, an object that had been shot down, especially if it was a hobby balloon? I mean, I, I, I know that the um, AIM Sidewinder missiles, they, they do spray a huge amount of explosive shrapnel that would no doubt shred a balloon if it was a balloon. But um, I, I just, there's so much about that whole incident. Whilst I'm not saying, I'll reiterate, I'm not saying that they were necessarily anomalous. I have no information to suggest that. It's the way in which this issue has been so effectively shut down, I suspect because the White House was embarrassed about their overreaction. And if that really is the way that we respond to unidentified um, objects, then we're kind of screwed, mate. Yeah, it's not a good sign, is it? It's not really a good sign um, when that's the uh, when that's the first kind of response that you go for to uh, shoot down with lethal force. And it would uh, it would explain, in my opinion, why we're not really seeing direct contact from whatever it is that happens to be observing or interacting subtly with humanity, because we are uh, quite a violent species. Well, that was the other thing. I mean, in what way? Did the objects shot down over U.S. airspace after the Chinese balloon represent a threat to mm. security? They weren't. Exactly. They weren't in any known air corridors. Um, we haven't brought these objects down before, and we're told that there's been hundreds of them in the past. Um, why? You know, why did we suddenly decide to spend whatever it was, one and a half million dollars, shooting them down? Was it just because the public was pushing the White House into an overreaction. And and this is the issue. I, I, I think this has been a really good test run for, you know, if and when little green men from Zeta Reticuli do park their flying saucer on the White House lawn. You know, it's um it's so easy for the public to be bought off with ridicule and mockery. And, and even at the White House in the press conferences that took place there and in a lot of the press conferences in the following week, um, there was that normal little giggle that you get, you know, yeah, that yeah. little smile that goes over people's faces when the word alien comes up. And frankly, the only people who were talking about the possibility that it might be alien were the National Security Advisor and the White House Press Secretary. They're the people who suggested it. Now, why? <laughs> it's just so weird to me. The, the you know, I mean, like, I, I do understand the stigma. I mean, I get that it's part of of pop culture and it's part of Hollywood and, and, and there is that relationship, but just common sense, man, like just common sense in terms of the fact that there is a, there is a planet that happens to be populated by living creatures called planet earth. And we've observed that the universe is bloody massive and it's probably full of planets. At this point, it just feels pretty weird to giggle at the idea of, I mean, I, I, it's a different thing when they're here. I get that, that it's okay. Now it's not just if life exists, but it's here and it's doing things, but we're having so many military and government officials coming out and saying, these are doing things we can't do. It's doing things that we literally can't do. So at this point, since 2017, really, it's just become very apparent that this should not be laughed at. And I, to, I, to be honest, I was seeing the stigma change in the news. I remember the first news reports that were coming out early on when the New York Times dropped its first article, a lot of X-Files music and, a, you know, a lot of kind of like laughing at the subject. And then that died away. But I noticed the giggling in that in that conference as well and and i can't help but just have this little bit of like ah oh, you really just don't get but it how many of those journalists how many of those journalists in the white house press corps had actually done their research uh, and oh, knew okay. that there was a how many knew that there was a congressional report from the pentagon the previous year which reported to the president that some of these uncharacterized uap appear to have demonstrated unusual flight characteristics for performance capabilities and require further analysis. Right. Now, that is, in as, in as meek a way as possible, that is an on-the-record admission from the Pentagon, the intelligence community, that there are genuine objects that they cannot explain, that UFOs, UAPs are real. And, and I think 
the the thing that disturbs me is the quality of the national debate uh, in in the way in which the media dealt with this issue. There was just such a prime opportunity for a White House press correspondent to go. Sorry, um, mate. Does the president take take yourself back? Because that's my alarm going off. Oh, no, no problem at all. No, there was such a great opportunity for the 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 White House press secretary to be asked a key question. You know, look, we know a report to Congress has said there are many anomalous objects in our skies that cannot be explained. You know, why are you not releasing the videos? You know, there's the Mosul orb that Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp have published images of. Are you saying that orb is fake? Does the president have a view on this? It was a unique opportunity to segue from the huge distraction of this nonsense over the Chinese balloon and to actually focus on the issue at hand, which is, yes, UAP are a genuine national security issue and flight safety threat. And they blew it. And that's what worries me. What worries me is that the standard of discourse in the national debate, in America in particular, is just appalling. And yet, you know, I'm, I'm heartened. I was talking to somebody from France this week, and they were talking about, um, I hope I pronounce it properly, Japan, you know, the um, Japan, the uh, French quasi-governmental uh, UFO, UAP investigation oh, yeah, organization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, fr the French have been collecting data on UAPs for decades. They've been taking it seriously for decades. They've acknowledged it's real. And even your government, the British government, even though it has its head in the sand a lot of the time, in its Condine report, which it was begrudgingly forced to release, it admits there is a, a real phenomenon that it can't explain. And so yeah. in the face of that, that's data or data. How do you say it in America? Data, data. That's, I mean, that is evidence, data. That is data that should be looking, being looked at. And I suppose the one positive that came out of all of that silliness was that the um, politicians were um, goaded to come out of their offices and to make comments about the importance of monitoring and t and investigating these unidentified phenomena over U.S. airspace. Yeah, you know, for the first time, we had quite a number of people on the record basically saying, "Yeah, yeah, we're concerned about this," and and it was great for the president to be able to say, "Look, you know." I've been receiving briefings on this since 2021. So where's the journalist to stand up and say, excuse me, you say the president's been receiving briefings about this since 2021. Why? Well, if he's been receiving briefings, it's two years, right, since he was first told that there are these anomalous objects in our airspace. What's he been doing about it? Why hasn't this been before now a higher priority? Do you see how do you see how questions can be developed? It's not hard for dogged questioning to actually corner a politician and actually make them have to answer. Because the thing that amuses me is that when people like Marco Rubio, John Kennedy were answering media questions during the week, they weren't responding to the, I think, inevitable explanation that was going to come, and it certainly did, that these were hobby balloons or some kind of mundane balloon or aerial craft of some kind. They weren't responding to that. They were responding to the notion that, yes, as we know from the interagency panel, as we know from the RO reports, the UAPTF reports, we know because we're getting secret briefings on it. This is a big issue. These objects are manifesting themselves in our airspace and there's nothing we can do about them. They do have performance capabilities and flight characteristics that are way beyond ours. That's what they were talking about. So why didn't the media start asking that question? And and this is the issue, is that um, uh, it, it's been used as a distraction. And, and the fact that the media was so quickly bought off, oh, yes, chaps, you know, you're, you're at risk of embarrassing yourself here because this is just a hobby balloon. If this really was a hobby balloon, for example, all of these balloons, by law, are meant to have transceivers on them that broadcast their position. Sorry? Where's the transceiver? You know, uh, uh, was they tracking? You know, has anyone tried to track down the hobby group responsible and 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 actually interview them about the technology that they had on the the object? Did their description accord with the the U.S. Air Force's description? Has anyone asked whether that particular object can go to the heights that we're talking about here? 
There's just so many questions, and this is what worries me, is that nobody's asking those questions. That That's the beard that I have in my bonnet, Jay, that, that um, we let them off too quickly. Well, this is what worries me as well, Ross, and, uh, you know, I mean, at least we do have some journalists like yourself and, and some others out there in the field that are genuinely pushing for trying to actually get real information about this out into the uh, into the wider public. But it, it worries me as well, especially because, in in all honesty, and you you know this just as well as I do, they're dealing with like the surface, surface, surface level of the narrative of, of UFOs and the implications of it and yeah. what might have already happened for the last 50, 60, 70 years. And they can't even do good journalism and good reporting and good investigation and good questions on just the basics of there's something flying in our sky that we don't understand. They're incapable of doing that. How can we honestly expect these people to start asking about special access program structures and, and USAPs and waved SAPs and, you know, the idea that Lockheed or Boeing or Raytheon having you know, programs that need to be investigated. We're, we're nowhere near, I, I hate to say it, but we're just nowhere near that point of interest, that point of pushing in terms of the uh, the kind of journalistic sector and also in, in the political sector. There's not enough talk about this. You just said before, when we first got into the conversation, that you started off not really having that feeling, but you're now at the point where you're relatively convinced that there is at least some form of program whether it's a legacy program of some form that was dealing with or is still dealing with non-human technologies. I mean, why, uh, if you can kind of help us out with that without being, well, whilst being careful, why do you feel that way now? What What is it that's convinced you over the journey through this subject that you now believe quite firmly that we have these types of programs? Well, there's obviously what you and I have spoken about before, which is the evidence that I put in my book, people like Nat Kovitz. And then... More recently, I've spoken to people who've talked to me about the program. Uh, there are people who are now speaking to Congress, they're a bit wary of Arrow, who are coming forward, giving evidence. Now, the reason I can say I'm not 100% sure that it's all true is because I haven't seen these objects, I haven't seen these technologies. but. I mean, something is manifesting itself in our atmosphere. And I just had a hunch that some of it might be terrestrial, some of it might be human. Is somebody testing craft in our airspace? Um, and, you know, using the explanation of UFOs, which is immediately able to be sort of mocked and ridiculed and, and isolated, is a really good way of shutting down media interest in an issue if you're, say, test flying a surveillance platform. I mean, I, I, there's a guy um, who appeared on my podcast, John Chapman, former British soldier who served in Ukraine, and he and six other members of the special forces team that he was with behind the lines in Ukraine, they were in Russian lines, looked up in the middle of a battle. They're actually being shelled in the middle of a battle, and they see an object literally just apparate, appear in front of them. It's a triangular craft with lights. It appears to just come from nowhere. Now, as a result of that conversation, I've had conversations with other people in Ukraine and also around the world who talk to me about a an ISR platform, an intelligence surveillance reconnaissance platform that is being used by the Americans. Now, the implications of that, if true, are momentous because it suggests that they've got quite advanced technology that we don't yet know about and which almost certainly haven't been disclosed to Congress. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there is an enormous potential for there to be quite momentous revelations that come out of what Congress has told in the next year or so. Um, but the, the worry is what sort of treatment will it get from investigative media? By the way, do you know anybody who wants to fund an investigative TV series with a journo called Ross Coulthard who just might want to actually see some decent journalism on this? The thing that frustrates me is I would love to have parachuted into the Alaskan wilderness and actually had a look to oh, see. Buddy, I'd be right there. there with you. I'd be right there. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, I, I mean, this is what should be happening. Journos yeah. should be literally testing the government on its claims. 
if there really has been a search, what does the flight data show? I mean, I know military aircraft can turn off their um, can turn off their tracking, but you know, we should be FOIing the radar data for that part of Alaska to see whether or not there were search aircraft deployed over the area at the at the time the U.S. Air Force says. Um, let's check the story out. I mean, um, the, the thing that I find really puzzling is um, the big lesson from the Iraq war, the tragedy of the Iraq war, is that hundreds of thousands of people have died, mostly civilians, for a war that was done on a false pretext, completely false intelligence. Governments get things wrong all the time. I, I don't believe it was an active conspiracy. I'm not, I don't buy into those nonsense conspiracy theories. But I think people deluded themselves. Intelligence services do sometimes get confirmational bias. And if, for example, a legacy program of some kind has been kept secret, if that's true, and if Congress is going to be briefed about that, how do we know the decision-making behind those in power at the time? What motivated those decisions? Why has it been kept secret? Is it just to preserve American military dominance if they can crack these technologies? I mean, the, the, the ramifications of this are enormous. They have enormous significance for the human race. Hey, everyone. I'm sorry to interrupt what I imagine is a really interesting conversation. I just wanted to let you know about Project Unity's new merchandise store, where you can find a selection of clothing from hoodies and T-shirts to hats and even a duffel bag. You can also grab stickers, coffee mugs, and more. It's a great way to help Project Unity grow, and you get some stylish merchandise at the same time. You can also choose to support Project Unity via Patreon for as little as $4 a month, and this will give you access to our private Discord server, which has become a bustling social hub full of researchers and passionate people, a very friendly community, and we would love to see you become a part of it. You can also donate through PayPal if you like, and links to all of these can be found in the description box below. And of course, to help us in our battle against the YouTube algorithm, the best thing you can do is like this video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell to stay updated. And now, I'll let you get back to that fascinating talk. Why is it being kept secret? Is it just to preserve American military dominance, if they can crack these technologies? I mean, the, the, the ramifications of this are enormous. They have enormous significance for the human race. And I know it's been dismissed as crackpot conspiracy theories for so many years, but you've got too many people now coming forward with evidence asserting that they're aware of crash retrievals. There's been far too many witness reports of crash retrievals. Um, I, I'm sorry, I just think we're at a stage now, we're at a pro bit of balance where media have to start digging. And the problem is, this is at exactly the time when major main, mainstream news organisations are being gutted. You know, the, the first thing to go is investigative journalism. Uh, the, the tragedy is it costs money and it's risky. You get sued. But this is what's needed right now. What is needed is an aggressive dig, a really hard, aggressive dig, well-resourced to get to the bottom of this. And um, that's, I guess, what I, I, I despair. I mean, I, I've got this statement in front of me from a, a major Olivier Galon from NORAD, presumably Canadian-French, and he reported on the Sunday at the time when the White House the following day was still saying they had no idea what these objects were. He was saying that NORAD already knew for sure what the objects were, yet the public couldn't be told and still hasn't been told. And you know what? It's almost like the public doesn't care anymore. Let's just get on with the next episode of the Kardashians and ignore the fact that, for whatever reason, there was a... Re I mean, I, I just have this gut feeling that there was a disinformation program, that we've been told that these are hobby balloons, and that was the inevitable mockery thing that makes the media drop off it like a hot potato, because who's going to chase up a story about a hobby balloon? But... In many ways, if it was a hobby balloon and if the White House made the decision to shoot it down, that's appalling. That's an absolutely egregious, terrible thing to have done. Um, I'm 
not an expert on flight tracking, but I'm told that these balloons weren't in any known float path, flight path. They weren't going to hit any commercial aircraft. So if there are hundreds of these objects all the time, why was a decision made by the President of the United States and the Pentagon to bring them down? And why can't we be shown the videos of what they did and what they engaged with? And why, why have they not been able to find anything? These are the questions that I just think any reasonable person should be asking. In the same way that, for example, when witnesses come forward, like James Fox's fantastic film on the incident of an alleged crash in Brazil. You know, he's got witnesses on the record saying that there was a crash, possibly even a life form that were recovered. Now, when has anyone gone to the Pentagon press room and said, listen, I just want to ask you, did you guys deploy an aircraft on or around this date to retrieve something from this little town in Brazil? And if they try and evade it, come back again and ask the question again. And this is the issue. I mean, uh, there's a, there's a, um, there was a uh, very early the story that I was involved in as a political reporter for the Sydney Morning Herald, and we had a, a minister who <laughs> didn't want to say that we'd given a private company a loan, a government loan, to help them build something enormous. And it was controversial because, you know, essentially public money was being used in a way that was controversial. And so the very astute senior political correspondent told me to stand in one corner of the press room, another person from our office in another corner of the press room, and all four of us basically stood in the corner of the press room and dominated the news conference asking the same question over and over and over again. And it was great theatre because the minister ducked and weaved and tried to avoid answering the question. And then finally, after about 10 minutes of agonising evasion, he was forced to admit, I think the words he used, that the company had been given an assured revenue stream. He just couldn't bring himself to say the word loan. And then as a result of that uh, bit of evidence, I, I got a scoop the following day from somebody who leaked to me from a merchant bank the funding arrangement and the fact that the government was hiding this, um, this loan that they'd given to this company in very dubious circumstances. And that's how you break a story. And I mean, I don't honestly think the same newspaper would do that same thing again anymore. You know, it's lost its sense of fun with asking questions. But our, our role as media is to hold power to account and to test claims. And and th this is my worry. I, I think it has a direct relationship with what's going on in the UAP sphere, because I just think so many times we just let them off the hook. I mean, yeah, for example, I mean, the Sentinel thing, this Tic Tac, John Greenwald has reported on um, an FOI that somebody came to him about. Uh, you know, it's on the record now that, that highly advanced US satellites detected an object in orbit shaped like a Tic Tac. <laughs> is, is anyone going to ask for an explanation? And while I'm at it, I, I've been talking to a guy recently here in Australia who's been going through the original Apollo moon mission uh, films. And, um, you know, it's the old thing of going back and looking at the evidence. And there are objects yes, shot yes. during the Apollo missions that, that are inexplicable. Yeah. And yeah. during some of the shuttle missions. So why haven't people gone to NASA and just basically stood at the NASA press conference and handed the administrator until he answers the question? Why do we just accept that, oh yes, yeah, strange objects seen off space shuttles, strange, ob strange objects filmed off Apollo moon mission, well, you know, I don't numerous, think, astronaut, I, 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 numerous astronauts saying they'd seen weird things. Why, why do we not push the issue? I, I don't Part think... of the issue is that media are so captive to the source that they're getting their information from. Well, that's the problem. I don't think they know about those types of videos and those types of cases and those types of testimonies. I mean, these these types of things are pretty much the uh, the, the kind of content of a UFO documentary. And thus e easily ridiculed, uh, and thus um, easily ridiculed. So yeah, I mean they don't they don't have the ability to reference. Well, what about this Apollo mission footage? That's you know they don't they don't have that in their in their in their space of reference. 
So it's, yeah. it's an education issue. It's an ignorance issue. And again, it comes from the stigma. I think one of the antidotes um, to this, and obviously you must be catching on to that yourself because you and Bryce have developed a fantastic podcast, uh, which I would very much recommend people check out if they haven't done all, done so already. The uh, Need to Know podcast with Bryce Abel and Ross Coltart. Fantastic. I mean, you guys just have a great chemistry. And uh, obviously, you're both already uh, used to public speaking, so there's a very good kind of presentation and flow to it. But the reason I bring up the podcasting space is because this has become, in many ways, not just with the UFO subject, but with media in general, a bit of an antidote to this very, you know, dusty, refined channel of mainstream reporting. And I think a good case of that, obviously, would be someone like Joe Rogan, who is just incredibly popular and Hopefully at some point we can get Ross on Joe Rogan because I feel like that would be one hell of a conversation to have. Um, but I... Uh, can I ask you that, how, how many listeners do you get on average to your podcast? It depends on the cons. It depends on who it is. So you you usually draw a bit of a crowd. So I would expect this one to surpass 10K in a couple of days, like three or four days. And then... But, but I mean, what, there's one, one, one of mine with you has gone into the millions from memory, hasn't it? No, not the millions. That would be amazing. The the one, the, I think the one that's most viewed from you is about a hundred and twenty thousand, and then uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Well, so I'm just looking here at the cable news rankings for the twenty five to fifty four year old demographic on Tuesday, January the thirty first, twenty twenty three, and these are the ratings for the top American cable TV networks. Right, right. And so you know, Tucker Carlson tonight. Is getting four hundred and fifteen thousand viewers. Is that it? It's, that's it. And then wow, um, Anderson Cooper on CNN is getting one hundred and thirty six thousand. Oh, Wait, yeah. you're out rating. You're out rating Anderson <laughs> Cooper. Well, that's good. To CNN know. CNN Newsroom, ten a.m. one hundred and twenty one thousand. Inside Politics noon CNN one hundred and thirty three thousand. Frankly, I mean, in fairness, my, my my 120 is a blips in the algorithm, but you know, it's nice to have a couple of times where I've been. Yeah, no, but I mean, I've, I've I've been quite flattered because you know I I did a I did a doco with Bryce um, with Channel Seven and we put it up on YouTube. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's that's just been seen by millions. Oh yeah, that one went. And, and 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 my point is is that you're right. Mm -hmm. What's happening is the media is failing to cover this issue. And so all of these news networks that are sitting here wondering where they've got shit ratings, they might ask, be asking, why are we not covering this issue? Now, in fairness, the guy at the top of the list, who, whose politics I may not necessarily agree with, he's been Tucker covering Carlson. it. He's been covering it. He's been covering it. it. No, it's interesting. It, it is interesting that the guy at the top of the list of cable news networks in America and that 25 to 54 year old demographic is the guy who covers UFOs. Mm -hmm. I just think mm -hmm. that's important. I do think, and I think, and it it really strikes me that when you actually look around at some of the um, great content that's being done, I mean, uh, Jeremy Corbell and um, George Knapp's weaponized, uh, and um, is it oh Mystery Wire George's um, mm -hmm. website? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mystery. Wire. Um, uh, your Project Unity. Some of these shows are doing better than the circulation of an average daily newspaper. I mean. Some daily newspapers in Australia are down well below 100,000 readers. Right, right. And, and you might notice they use readers these days. They're not yeah. talking about people who actually buy the paper. No. Very few just, people. Just read. Very few people buy the paper anymore. Yeah. And, and at the heart of this, frankly, is the, what that leads to is those organizations have to lay off staff because they can't fund the kind of journalism they want to do. I mean, when I first started in newspapers, newspapers regularly sold hundreds of thousands of copies every day, sold, and they were read by millions. Now they're, they're dummying up dodgy numbers on their online audiences and tweaking here and tweaking there to make it look as good as possible. But they've all been caught short because they didn't realize that the internet was going to overtake them. And I, I can remember news bosses in network television years ago saying to me, ah, oh, Roscoe, don't worry about the bloody internet. The internet's not going to, we'll see it off. It's not an issue, mate. You know, if network television's here to stay, rivers of gold advertising are here to stay, and they're not. And what's interesting is that, that at the time when probably the story of the moment that you and I agree is the biggest story of the moment, UAPs, this incredible mystery, 
ought properly to be being investigated, the media has never been weaker than it is now. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. But this is... And, and, again, and the... Cool. I apologize. I interrupted no, 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 no. Go ahead. Finish your thought. No, no. I was just, I was just reinforcing because I, I mean, I, I, I do. I mean, I, I had no idea. I always thought that American TV programs rated hugely in, in mm. the millions. But, um, I mean, uh, the lead with Jake Tapper, it's 80,000 viewers. Right, right. Um, and in comparison, tonight. in comparison, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan gets something of like 11 to 13 million, million. And that's it. And that's what I love about Joe Rogan. I'm, yeah. Again, I may not necessarily agree with all his guests, but... Um, Boy, why are millions of people exactly. gravitating to exactly. podcasts like yours and mine and Joe Rogan in particular? They're doing it because of a deep dissatisfaction that they're not getting the, the yeah. news, the information, the stories that they want from mainstream legacy media. Right. But, and but and you've you, got you, these... You see the response from mainstream media that Joe Rogan is an alt-right conspiracy platform that you know spreads misinformation. And yet you have the majority of people in the viewership of news demographic tuning into Joe Rogan. And like you said, and pointed out through the metrics you kindly printed out on a piece of paper, these people are doing shit in terms of their ratings. And so it's just yeah. kind of evident that actually most people don't agree with you that these people are channeling misinformation and would actually rather listen to them. And I think another yeah. thing real quick is that you have... Uh, these long form podcasts, you can't misinterpret a three hour conversation, but you can misinterpret little sound bites that you put on CNN or on Fox News. And I think that's another issue. Absolutely. It's the spin. It's the spin factor that people are just fed up with. Fed up with it. Yeah. It's funny. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Kurt Jaimungal, uh, who, as you know, is. Yeah, like he's a, great. He's great. I, I think he's a trained physicist and he just asks such good questions mm. and he's got this manner that. You know, I, I, I'm an interviewer myself, but the thing I love about Kurt is he's, he's a bit like you. He just he dangles you on the hook, and before you know where you are, you're telling him things you didn't really mean yeah. to. <laughs> and <laughs> and, um, and I'm, I'm so looking forward to, to watching his interview with uh, Leslie Kane. Mm. And um, I'm also looking forward to, you know, the Eric Weinstein interview, which I've, I'm told is an absolute cracker, which runs for four hours. And I mean, you don't get four-hour interviews on network television. You're never going to get that. No, no. And that that's... and this is the thing. And this is the thing, Jay. Sorry, I'm on a rant now. No, no, go ahead. We're at a point. No, no, we, I mean, I, I, I have this argument with editors of news organizations who say to me that people really can't think much beyond the length of the average crap and, and that essentially um, people don't want details. They don't want information. And, and and that's why we dumb down with newspapers like USA Today that have four paragraph news stories or 12 paragraph news stories. You know, everything's got to be condensed and we've got to have news bites. Here we are, though. We have this phenomenon online where the most popular podcast, vodcast in the world is a guy who does interviews with people for hours and hours and hours. And you can try and marginalize them all you like. But by golly, they're great interviews. He gets some fantastic stuff out of them. And if the media actually started listening to them, they might actually learn something and they might actually start generating some news stories. That's the issue for me is that, um, you know, it's all very well them talking about, for example, the circulating of QAnon nonsense and stuff like that. If anyone, if any group did more to circulate QAnon nonsense, it was the sections of the mainstream media in the United States that were quite reckless in the way that they reported certain things during the um, uh, period after the 6th January insurgency. Um, and that's coming out now. But the, um, the, the fact is, we have amazing work being done by people online, and the audience is responding. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, 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 the thing that, th this is the big difference, I suppose, now for the people who tried to control the narrative back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah. It's a different dynamic now. They it's could, a different dynamic. They're not going to, you know, Jay Anderson's not going to listen to uh, some Navy general coming in and telling him, Jay, you're not allowed to tell that story, son. You know, uh, uh, you know do, a, do, a, do a different story, son. Um, and here's a nice story that you can tell. You know, says nice things about us. Not gonna happen, mate. <laughs> and, I mean, and and this is interesting because, um, okay, you're not a trained journalist, but you're asking great questions. 
Thank and you. and this is the thing that I I find is being lost in all of this is that um and I, I know I have a scratchy record on this but um we are just being very very badly served you know at a time when astonishing admissions have been made on the public record I know. by numerous public officials like you know when um when a certain CIA director said that he had a Navy friend whose jet fighter stopped mid-air. Yeah, that was Woolsey, wasn't it? Was that Woolsey? It was Woolsey. No. I, I, why the hell did people go to Woolsey and basically say, mate, did you really mean stopped, as in engines firing, not moving? W what do you mean? Um, uh, you know, I, I just, this time and time again, public officials have actually dropped players. Like, has Barack Obama, as I hear he has, been briefed about the UAP issue yeah, since yeah. he stopped being president? Look at the narrative from the White House in 2011 when they issued a press release under Barack Obama, basically asserting a complete lack of interest in UAPs, denying any knowledge of UAPs on the planet or any engagement with UAPs. And then look at what Obama has said more recently, presumably since he was briefed. That's what I find fascinating. It, and people should be chasing down those burrows. And what's more, it's fun. I mean, it's fun. This is a really interesting story because we know how the funnest stories, the ones that are the most fun in journalism are the ones where you know somebody's concealing something and you know parts of the answer. And so you can basically use the power of the media to basically start embarrassing those officials into revealing a little bit more. And that's almost what happened with the Chinese balloon incident. That's why it was important, because it showed how when the media start ganging up, the White House press secretary, the national security advisor, go into a panic, and they go to the president and say, look, we, we really have to say something. I'm, I'm really sorry, Mr. President. We can't ignore this. We've got to make a statement. We've got to do something. We have to be seen to be doing something on this. And, and the positive that came out of that is extra resourcing for ARO and an increased focus by the members of the Congress, the Senate, the Republic, uh, the both representatives of both sides, um, that they're really now focused on these unidentified objects coming into American airspace. But the problem is the media, as soon as they were told they were probably hoppy balloons, they went, ah, oh, yeah, that's probably the most plausible explanation. We really shouldn't push this issue anymore because yeah. we might get laughed at. This is a phenomenon that, as you know, has been around for thousands of years. So much, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's absurd. It's, it's absurd. 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 It's absurd. Did you check out? Um, did you check out the interview with Eric Weinstein on Joe Rogan recently? Did you uh, Did you watch it? I did such a long interview. I, long. I I had it on my iPad, and I I loved listening to it. And there were moments where. It's funny, I like Eric Weinstein because he's like a dog on a bone. Mm. And it's interesting, I'd love to know a lot more about the circumstances of his work with um, Peter Thiel from Palantir yeah. because yeah. he's been, until very recently, he's been the managing director of Thiel Capital. Uh, and it's interesting because Weinstein's been taking a very prominent position in aggressively asking questions. I know he's been briefed by a lot of the people who've come public, people like Lou Elizondo. Um, I know he's had one-on-ones with these people and, and been told certain things. Um, he talked, uh, one of the things I'm really keen to listen to in the interview, I haven't got to it yet, is when he talks about how he and Sam Harris were told that they were going to be taken to a location in Colorado presumably Cheyenne Mountain or some U.S. Air Force facility, and shown something mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. would be momentous. And, you know, I've, I've actually tweeted about it because I've heard um, Sam Harris say something similar about a year ago. And um, again, I mean, the, the fact that uh, a highly respected, um, I think he's a mathematician, physicist, Eric Weinstein, uh, is making statements like that, that clearly somebody from the US government was contemplating giving him and one of America's most prominent philosophers a briefing about presumably a non-human intelligence of some kind or perhaps retrieve material. 
wh- why is there such a lack of in- of curiosity by the rest of the media? I mean, are they not listening to interviews like that? that that's my issue. I, I mean, th- there's been some momentous ad- admissions made by different people. Eric Davis, for example, one of my favourite characters, has made repeated assertions that he's aware of a, a crash retrieval program recovered craft um and and i know he's given evidence to congress yeah i mean it's what well, he was brought up as well um by eric weinstein during the conversation and uh, also obviously you mentioned sam harris and eric discussing this you know interesting individual that reached out to them and was giving them all of this uh, kind of information or at least promising to provide information. But Eric seemed to feel like he was being given the runaround, you know. And you, I mean, you and I have shared a few contacts over the years, but one of them always confounded us in regards to their true background and their intention. And this is the individual that went by the name Holden, who, uh, you know, also later got in touch uh, with, and, uh, and I believe is actually still in touch with the forensic geologist and Travel Channel presenter Scott Walter. And then I hear about, you know, Eric Weinstein's interactions with an individual who was making a lot of promises and bold statements, but never really seemed to come through with anything and would always have some sort of excuse for not being able to provide what they previously promised. And even though it's probably not the same person, it just made me think back to Holden, who was, uh, you know, incredibly intelligent, but we could never really figure out uh, if he was being deceiving or not. Have you actually had more experiences like this from people claiming oh, inside of backgrounds? I, I mean, I've been yeah. inundated. How do you navigate it as a journalist? It's hard. I mean, I'm mean, i I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with one at the moment who, um, I don't want to go into specifics, but, you know, they, they claim knowledge of certain things. And um, the thing that infuriates me is that when I go into what I would normally regard as just basic questioning, times, dates, places, people involved. You know, I'm trying to find holes in the story. And he knows I am. And what happens is they go vague, you know, and and that's often a sign that there's something not quite right. And then I've been back-checking this person and good people have have, uh, vouched for them and said that he's got bona fides, he's for real. And they suggested to me that the reason he's going vague is because partly I'm a foreigner, I'm a non-American. And maybe he's cautious about admitting things that are national security sensitive to a even a friendly power like Australia, a, a, a citizen of that country. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a constant weighing to go. and It's why I'm never 100% sure when people talk to me and say that and I've, I've had multiple people now tell me that they're aware of the program or they've had peripheral involvement with the program. Um, Matt Kobitz introduced me to a number of them, and um, I don't know what to make of it. You know, I, I mean, I, I still think that there's a possibility that we're all being had, that, that mm. the whole thing might just be a an American effort to try and encourage the Chinese and the Russians into a belief that just perhaps they have technologies that mean that those potential enemies shouldn't screw with them. You know, it's it's a it's a good thing, disinformation. It was how Winston Churchill won the war. You know, um, basically, uh, if if you're weak, then you you want your enemy to think that you're strong. And um, maybe it's disinformation. Maybe this whole thing is just clever disinformation. I doubt it. Well, I mean, but, this is yeah. kind of where Eric Weinstein seems to be doing this with his needle, where he's like, there's something well, here, but I also feel like there's a psyop, it feels like there's disinfo. And and one thing that kind of messed with him, at least that's what it seemed to feel like when he was talking on Joe Rogan, was when he said that when he was speaking with Eric Davis, he'd met up with Eric Davis, and uh, he'd basically said to Eric, like, you know, where, where are the physicists? Where are all the people? Where are the yeah. people? And Eric Davis said to him, well, it's me, you and Hal that are basically on this. And then, I, and then Weinstein says to Joe Rogan, like, Joe, I'm not even on this. So they're saying that there's just us three there. So what do you make of a comment like that from Eric Davis? I, I thought that was slightly naive of Eric, to be honest, at risk of incurring Eric's ire. I mean, I, I, right, I, right. Know for a, I, know, I know for a fact that there are physicists who are engaged in work for the US government that might be capable of being perceived as some kind of legacy program attempting to back engineer materials, objects. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think Eric's point was quite legitimate, is that if you'd gone back at the time of the Manhattan Project and looked at 
where are all the key physicists and key engineers working right now? Where have they all gone? I mean, if, if the Nazis had really done their homework and actually had a close look at all of the people that were involved in um, uh, the, the kind of physics that allows you to build a nuclear bomb or an atomic bomb, um, they could have probably figured it out a bit earlier. And um, the interesting thing is, if you look, there are people, and I've done it, you know, there are papers that have written, and then all of a sudden people disappear. I mean, one of the great examples is Ning Li, the Chinese um, physicist who sadly has passed away a couple of years ago, but she, um, she made extraordinary claims that she developed an anti-gravitic effect with some technology that she developed, and then all of a sudden she quite literally disappeared. Yep. And I, I, I found her in Huntsville, Alabama. You know, she was living in Huntsville, Alabama when I was researching my book. And sadly, it turns out she wasn't well. But, um, you know, why was she in Huntsville, Alabama? Well, Huntsville, Alabama just happens to be where there is a confluence of some of America's top scientists involved in, oh, spacecraft research. Interesting there. You know, I mean, and you know, a lot of people have asked questions about Ning Li, but I don't buy the line that there isn't a trail. There are people involved in high high level areas of physics who've just disappeared off the grid, and um, you know some of them are Australian. One of the best bits of success that I had was in following a trail. I got told about by somebody from from our government that I should follow the trail of a, a certain Australian who disappeared into the American defense intelligence areas. And um, same with your Brett as well. Able, are you able to say the name of that individual? No, I could not no. possibly do that, no. Oh, but the, um, um, the, you know, and also the work of organizations like, um, oh, Jay, British Aerospace. Oh. So I say that again? British Aerospace. I don't British, know why that British just occurred to me. Yeah, British, British, British Aerospace. Yeah. I'll tell you, British yeah. Aerospace. British Aerospace. If I was an investigative journalist, I would be taking a very close look at BAE. BAE was one of the ones that was talking about creating lab-grown drones through some form of weird chemicalized electrolysis process where they would just form a drone through electrified matter and it would just grow in a lab in a vat. They were also um, they're really a formerly a British company. I mean, they're now primarily an American aerospace company and it's it's who they've taken over that's significant. Okay. That's where I'm that's where, it, that's where I'm give looking. us give us the scoop, Ross. Oh, I can't give you the scoop. I don't have it yet. But no, I, I, I think the one area that I'm trained in is in corporate law. You know, I I, I follow I follow company registration trails and, um, you know, there's a lot in journalism on public databases if you know how to look. And um, uh, I'm, I'm fascinated that, um, God, if I just had the resources of a New York Times investigative team to go down some of these burrows and, and a dedicated editor who said, yeah, you're off the leash, go boy. That's what's needed right now, you know, because um, it's only going to take one editor, one um, Ben Bradley. He's the guy who let Woodward and Bernstein off the leash. He's also the guy, by the way, who allowed the publication of the Pentagon Papers. A brave editor is what's needed. Somebody who's prepared to go, you know, I don't know if there's a story behind this for sure, but I've just got a, there's a stink about this. It's only going to take one major media organization to go, you know what, there's enough here. Let's, let's, let's chase down the members of the senior review group. Let's chase down the members of the Special Access Program Oversight Committee. Let's ask them individually, one by one, to deny that there's a legacy program. Let's go back through the... And, and then... And then, and then if they do lie, and it subsequently comes out in, commun in, in Congress, let's excoriate them and hold them up for the liars that they were. This is what they're worried about. These people are guarding their reputations. 
if there's been illegalities, if there's been an illegal program operating without oversight, without the control of the Congress, it's absolutely outrageous. But there's groundwork now that could be done where questions could be being asked because we may, Jay, be on the threshold of momentous revelations. Mm -hmm. I suspect they'll leak more than be officially released. I just hope and pray that good people in the Congress recognise that if a decision is made to suppress this, we have a right to know. The world has a right to know, not just the American people. Um, and because, you know, if, 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 if they are sitting on technologies and energy systems, if that's true, that's just outrageous, you know. A large part of the horrible conflict in Ukraine is essentially over energy. You know, most conflicts, the Iraq war, energy. You know, it's sad, but what if there was a technology that made all of that irrelevant? Wouldn't that be pretty cool? Wouldn't that be a, gee, a story? Why doesn't it take a, it would only take one editor to go, to, to deploy an investigative team. And I've been part of those investigative teams. And I can tell you, when you're on the receiving end of the kind of questioning that we do, officials get scared because you saw a taste of it with the Chinese balloon incident. What was important about that incident is that people got the chance to see how a government reacts when it's under pressure. And it wasn't much pressure at all. You just had every cable news service, every news bulletin saying the president should come out and make a statement. What the hell? There's stuff coming into our airspace. There are objects in our airspace. We don't know what they are. That's outrageous. Mr. President, you need to come out and say something. And as a result of that, we've had an enormous number of concessions, legislative changes, improvements to funding, just because of that overreaction. Imagine if the media started asking questions. I mean, imagine if just one of our mainstream newspapers in the legacy media just started doing basic, proactive investigative journalism and got out there and started rattling the cage and said, come on, let's get to the truth of this. We've had so many public officials now say there is a crash retrieval program, there is a legacy back engineering program. This is all nonsense, I'm sure, but let's get to the bottom of it. Let's go and ask these people. Well, that I don't think it's... I mean, they don't even need to try that hard in terms of the groundwork. People like yourself, myself, other researchers have already laid down the groundwork for these journalists. I mean, all you have to do, any journalist who might be listening, who might be interested in probing into something like the Special Access Oversight Committee and the Senior Review Group. I did a video with a anonymous dude called Mr. X. But you, uh, you look at the content of that and we spell out quite plainly who was involved, who were the names in the very important Admiral Wilson documents that were discovered at the estate of Edgar Mitchell, an Apollo astronaut, about a conversation with a PhD astrophysicist and a former director of the DIA about retrievals and crash engineering programs. And we broke down that story to the point at which the New York Times was interested at one point. And Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal were very interested in doing a story on the Admiral Wilson leaks. And it seems that the editorial process was the part in the uh, channel into getting that publish published that, uh, that prevented the story from actually getting out. And uh, the Admiral Wilson leaks are extremely important. They've been put in the, into the congressional record now. Um, and uh, there's enough information out there. It's already been done. The work's already been done by other people who aren't even journalists, you know, who are just podcasters and researchers on, on YouTube. You know, th this is this should be a, a message to people who are actually crafting careers in journalism. When you're being scooped by a 28-year-old in the UK who doesn't know anything about journalism, you really need to start reassessing how, how you're going about your, uh, your craft. Let me tell you a story, Jay. This has got nothing to do with UAPs, but it's a story I, I often tell younger investigative journalists or people aspiring to do investigative journalism. Years and years ago, probably about 30 years ago, there was a guy called Oscar Guerrero who walked into the Sydney Morning Herald with a photograph and he showed it to a, a senior journalist who I won't name out of him, avoiding embarrassment. And he said, this is a photograph of the Israeli nuclear processing Demona reactor where they're building nuclear bombs and the Herald editor thought this guy's a loony 
and he basically showed them out of the building. About five weeks later, the guy from whom Oscar had got that photograph, a guy called Mordecai Vernunu, left Australia. He'd been painting a fence at St Stephen's Anglican Church on Darlinghurst Road near King's Cross in the middle of Sydney with Oscar Guerrero, and he told him that he was an Israeli who'd worked at the secret nuclear base where the Israelis were building nuclear bombs. And Oscar was a bit of a an operator, and he said, look, I'll go on your behalf and I'll see if we can get somebody interested from the media in this story. And because it was Oscar, nobody took him seriously, and they showed him out of the building. Anyway, <laughs> um, Mordecai Venuna then goes to England, and he walks into the offices of, sadly, the uh, newspaper owned by Robert Maxwell, who <laughs> turns out to have been a spy for Mossad, Israeli intelligence. And so the moment that he shows Robert Maxwell the image of the Demona nuclear reactor, the Israelis know then that their nuclear weapons program is compromised by Mordecai Venunu. And so they organize a snatch. And the only reason that the story of the Israeli nuclear weapons program ever became public was because, just as a backup, Mordecai Venunu walked across the road to the London Sunday Times, one of the world's greatest newspapers, and showed the same photographs to a journalist who had the presence of mind just to send the photograph to a friend of his in Oxford who knew a little bit about building nuclear bombs. And within an hour or two, the Sunday Times of London had the world's biggest scoop of the day, which was that the Israelis had the nuclear bomb. And Mordecai Venuno, of course, went to Italy. He was um, snatched by Israeli intelligence and put in jail for many, many years. But I often tell that story because you do, you get weirdos coming into newsrooms who offer you stories. And um, often they present as complete Walter Mitty's. I, I always listen to them because who would have thought, who would have thought that the guy painting a fence with um, a South American opportunist who decided to make some fun out of the photograph with the Sydney Morning Herald, who would have thought that he was sitting on one of the biggest stories of the moment? and that he was compelled because he couldn't get anybody in the Australian media to follow it, to take it overseas, and it sadly showed it to the wrong newspaper first. That, that's what I find fascinating, is that, that every now and then there are momentous stories right under our noses. Uh, and, and if you don't look, you don't find. And the best journalism is when you actually just take the time to look. <laughs>